her to read a little. Ah, oh, there's lots of answers to that. Uh, and of course, you make the you know, you'd be very foolish if you had a single answer because you've got to you've got to package it to the person. Um, and I'll, I'll start with one anecdote, which I might, which I've probably told in print before, but but it reveals some of the places that you can go with that. Uh, I once did a, perhaps rather ill-advisedly, did a reality TV show, um, which had been organised by a British celebrity chef who had taken a group of failed youngsters from high school, 16-year-olds, and had decided that if he exposed them to um, really glamorous and celebrity teaching, they would suddenly get the learning bug. You, know, you can imagine how this goes down on British television. Yeah, just perfect. Uh, you know, and mostly, it showed to these people like me who were brought in to teach them that teaching a group of 20 kids who aren't very interested is you know, something which is more tough than you can ever believe. You know, ever, ever believe. But I was supposed to teach them Latin. Um, and, you know, basically the deal was that I teach them Latin, the cameras are on and they are, they kind of act up and say, oh, it's boring. Oh, but I had very few successes. Um, though I learned a lot about the difficulties of being a high school teacher. Um, what One success with, was with David Beckham's footballer's tattoos, which are some of them which are written in Latin. And that was quite interesting to them. But towards the end of the course, it's getting a bit demob happy. And I was running thin on what I'd still got that I thought could possibly be interesting to these kids. I decided to do two things in different weeks, and they were both amazingly successful. One was um, we did British place names. And uh, I said to them, had they ever noticed that all these places that end in Castor or Chester Castro, some, some, uh, Doncaster, Chester, Manchester, um, and they had actually because you, how could you not, you know, that that, and so I said, uh, did they know why that was? No, they didn't. And when when they found out because the Latin Castra meant camp and the Romans had been there, um, they actually for almost the first time looked really interested uh, because suddenly. This kind of low-level puzzle that had just been a kind of baffling part of British culture. You know, it wasn't one that kept them awake at night, but, you know, suddenly it meant something. You know, there was a reason why these places were called what they were. And although I've always sort of, I'm never a great sort of fan of etymology, I suddenly, you know, they opened their eyes and they thought, God, that makes sense now. And I remember saying to them, one day when you've got kids, you'll be telling them there was this funny old lady who explained to them about Chester and Castor. And they thought, you know, and they began to smile. And the, the final week, and it's really scraping the bottom of the barrel, I decided to do Roman numbers, not expecting any success. But, oh well, well. And they were absolutely wrapped in attention. They are writing down D, C, N. I'm writing it down. And at the end of the lesson, when the cameras are off, I said, look, you know, you're usually absolutely horrible. And we do this completely boring subject, which is Roman numerals. And you sit there and you're absolutely gripped. Why? And they said, and it's probably different on American telly, it's the only way you know when a television program is made. Because the, the date is given in Roman numerals. Now, if you know Roman numerals, you don't see that there's that there's a there's a cultural key there. But they say we don't. We, it's the only way we can know when they're made. And now those are extremely sort of trivial examples, and you would not want to justify the study of Latin and Greek or, or classical civilization or anything, certainly at university, on the basis that you know the etymology of British towns, or uh, you can tell when a television program is made. But I think there are they're little kind of metaphors, really, little kind of parables of what, what understanding something about the classical world can do for you. 
can actually make your... I mean, it's not about making, the, you know... It's not about making the classical world make sense. I mean, some of us might be happy to be interested in that. We could be interested in making any world make sense. It, it's because in some way that it opens up your own world to you. Now, I think it's... You know, there is a difficult bind here because you don't want to say that somehow classics and the Greco-Roman tradition is, you know, is definingly central to the Western tradition. You know, because that would be to ignore all the other things that were definingly central to the Western tradition. And, you know, and also, you know, we wouldn't actually want the ancient world to be definingly central to our tradition. But I think I, I would resist the idea that that somehow the ancient classical world, I would resist the claim that it had no special role. You know, it's still got a special role in its bloody number system, right? It's got a special role in the way, you know, I'm just currently making a film about Julius Caesar. How many people in the world know that the month of July is named after Julius Caesar? You know, probably about a hundred of us, you know, perhaps make it double that, treble that, thousands maybe, but a, but a trivial proportion. Does it make a difference to how you think about the way you, about how way time organised? Of course it makes a difference. You know, that somehow the calendar is a, the, you know, the calendar that we take for granted in the most trivial of kind of mechanistic ways is a deeply historicised edifice culturally provided by Julius Caesar. Okay, he didn't invent it, he got it from the Egyptians. But it comes to us that way, and he's still there, like Augustus is. And do you have to know that to understand our calendar? Well, not to use it in the way we usually do, but does it totally enrich your sense of what time is to know that? Yes. Of course it does. Now, if I was answering your question, you know, at different levels, you know, that you'd think of all kinds of different ways and different examples. You know, who's the, who is the best-selling philosopher in the world still? Plato. Awful as it is to say so. Plato. You know? um, so can you, can you shove this over? Are you impoverished if you shove it over? Yes, you can you now how do we get people to go and we may think it's not worthwhile um, but if we want people to go and look at art galleries how can you understand an art gallery if you don't have you know a, a, you know I mean an art gallery of a sort of you know metropolitan museum you know a, an, a, an art gallery a traditional art gallery you know what happens to you and go in there if you haven't got the foggiest clue what any of this is now you know, the thing is, you might rightly say to me, but when you go to um, a museum of Indian art, you're impoverished because you don't understand. And I've got to plead guilty to that. You know, and I hope I'm doing something about it. But, um, you know, and it's not, it's not as if classical culture has, you know, has some kind of predestined right to claim precedence over others. Of course it doesn't. Um, but there are things about the way we do things that are incomprehensible without it. So you go, you know, it's it's culturally disempowering not to know something. I think, I think.